after the epiphany because of the um, the end of time after Pentecost. So the epistle is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. Brethren, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. For thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is comprised in this word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The love of our neighbor worketh no evil. Love, therefore, is the fulfilling of the law. And please stand for the Holy Gospel. In the continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, when Jesus entered into the ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, a great tempest arose in the sea, so that the ship was covered with waves. But he was asleep, and they came to him and awakened him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And Jesus said to, saith to them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then rising up, he commanded the winds and the sea, and there came a great calm. But the men wondered, saying, What manner of man is this? For the winds and the sea obey him. And this Father words today's Holy Gospel. So, sorry, I forgot to announce it is the, uh, the Mass is taken from the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, <clears throat> because at the end of the time after Pentecost, um, we, we go to the Masses after the Epiphany um, to fill the gap between now and uh, the beginning of Advent. And then, um, if you could keep in your prayers, um, this upcoming Tuesday, uh, the seminary will be going to Wisconsin for the funeral of Angela Parker, who's the sister of... Um, Father Parker, she passed away last <coughs> Friday, and then uh, on my drive over here, I just got the word that um, it's Father Jean, John, I believe, Father Cadaro, who uh, was living in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, actually Father Hugo just went there to visit him, and he found him uh, dead in his chapel, so he just passed away. So keep them in your prayers especially, like we said, in this uh, month of November. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. So, the church, we know we're getting ready. We're, we're reaching the end of the time after Pentecost. We have a couple more Sundays where we wear green, and then we're, we'll be in the season of Advent. But before this, you know, season of Advent starts, we have a few feasts to celebrate. And... Um, we first, last Sunday, we celebrated the Feast of Christ the King. And so we, we celebrate Christ's kingship, not over just over the Catholic Church, especially now the Catholic Church, his kingship is shown in the form of the Pope, but also Christ is king over the entire world because he's man and God. And by his divine nature of being God, he is the reason why the entire world exists and the entire world was made for his glory. So the entire world, every part of it, is under his reign. So we celebrated the Feast of Christ the King. And then we know the Catholic Church has three parts. There's the Church Triumphant, which is the saints in heaven. The Church Militant, which is us, the faithful <coughs> on earth, who are still working out our salvation in fear and trembling. And then we have the Church Suffering in Purgatory. And so right after we celebrate the King, Christ our King, we go to... Um, this was Friday, this past two days ago, was the Feast of All Saints Day, where we celebrate the Church Triumphant, particularly, firstly, with the Blessed Virgin Mary. The, the Feast Day celebrates the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, and so we celebrate all of the Church Triumphant in the, how they have um, earned their glory throughout a life of virtue. And then the next day, which is yesterday, Saturday, 
is All Souls Day. And this is where we obviously don't celebrate, but we call to mind the church suffering. And so November is a very special month in the Catholic Church because we call to mind the souls in purgatory. And purgatory, we know, uh, exists. Um, it is a, as a matter of faith. We know it exists. One of the great proofs we have is in the sacred scriptures itself. We quote all the time uh, from the second book of Maccabees. They say, he says, it is a good and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they might be loosed from their sins. And so he's referring, we know that means that there is a place in between heaven and hell. The souls of the damned, they go to hell and we do not pray for them. It says that at the end time, at the judgment, the just will laugh at the souls in hell. They will, um, you know, we will see them choose their evil sin and we will laugh at them for their foolishness. And obviously we have the saints that go directly to heaven and um, they are very special cases. Most of us, uh, we know, we're not going to, I can't say we're not going to become saints, it's not a very good sermon. But the point is that uh, heaven is for the saints to go directly. <clears throat> but there has to be a place in between. Because most of us, what happens is, we want to do good, we want to give up our sin, we want to follow Christ, and we try. But we have a fallen human nature, and we have weakness, and so we fall into sin. And so we have many sins that we have to make uh, recompense for. And we do that one way that we do that is through the sacrament of confession or penance. We go and we tell the priest our sins, and he absolves our sins, and those sins are forgotten, and that eternal punishment of hell is wiped away. But there's still a, there's a twofold punishment for sin, that eternal punishment and a temporal punishment. And so that temporal punishment is not wiped away just by going to confession, but it is wiped away through good works, through our penance, through our prayers, and through our um, mortifications, and through our almsgiving to the poor. And these are ways that we wipe out the temporal punishment. But still, at the end of our lives, we still normally, the scale is still unbalanced and there's much temporal punishment to, be make, to make amends for. And this is why we have purgatory. Bishop Sheen says that purgatory is where God's love and God's justice meet each other. So in hell, the souls get the full wrath of God's justice. And obviously, his love is there too because um, we say that hell is actually a distraction from the pain of loss of God, because there's two pains in hell. There's the pain of sense, which is our, um, you know, the, the, the sense of smell, taste, feel. Those will all be punished for using them for sinful purposes. But also there's the pain of loss, which is the great sadness that the soul has to bear because he turned away from God, who is the only source of happiness. So in hell, there's the full justice of God. But in purgatory, there's both his loving mercy and his justice because it gives us a chance to cleanse our soul through those flames so that we might be worthy to go to him in heaven because like we said most of us we're not we can't if we look at our soul we know we're not worthy to be uh, to appear before God we have many things to answer for and while we strive to be saints and we have to strive for perfection the saints are kind of a, a, as Bishop Sheen says too, they're a glorious exception to the, the normal of, human, of mankind. Most of us, we have to make amends and we're not going to be able to do it all by ourselves. And that's why Christ gave us purgatory so that we might um, cleanse our souls and drive away those rem remnants of sin so that we might appear before God. But the church calls All Souls Day to remind us of the souls that are in purgatory right now. We're still on earth. We still have a chance to become a saint. We still can strive daily for perfection. We still can make amends for our sins. But the souls in purgatory, they cannot do that. They are helpless to themselves. They cannot pray for forgiveness. They cannot come back on earth and um, fast or, or abstain from things as mortification. That's why they always say if, you, if we were to ask a soul in purgatory what he, what he would ask for, if he could ask for anything, He'd ask for 10 more minutes to come on earth and he would do the most heartfelt prayer and he would do the most heartfelt penance so that he could reduce his time in purgatory. Because to, pre to prepare ourselves for God and to go to heaven, we have to be perfect. And that requires a great, very hot flame, a very uh, grave torment in purgatory. It's not, a, it's not a peaceful place. It's a place of suffering so that we can prepare our soul. But to get to the point... Those souls, they can do nothing for themselves. 
And so that's why we are required to pray for them. And that's why we are required to help them. So we, we compare the souls in heaven, to jump to heaven now. Uh, we normally compare them, uh, every soul in heaven, we say is perfectly happy. And he cannot have more happiness. There's nothing else he could possibly wish for because he's seeing God face to face. But we know that there are different levels of saints. There's Saints Peter, and then there's the soul right now that just went to heaven from purgatory. They're at different levels. The great saints have a higher uh, place in the hierarchy of heaven than others. And the way we explain that is we kind of compare them to different sized glasses. So the souls that just get into heaven by the skin of their teeth, we say they're like a shot glass. It's like a shot glass. It's full all the way to the brim with water. It's perfectly full. It's fully, perfectly happy to its full capacity. But maybe St. Peter the Apostle, he would be like a five-gallon bucket. He has more capacity because he gave more of his love on earth to God. And so they're both perfectly happy, but one has a higher level of perfection than the other. Well, the souls in purgatory, they're kind of like that, except their glasses aren't full. Their glasses are at very various levels. So some souls, they're almost filled their purgatory time. Maybe they had to do two years, and they're at you know one year and 360 days. They just have a little bit of time left. So their glass is 90% full. And so if we pray for them, maybe one Hail Mary is all it takes to fill their glass and get them to heaven. But there's other, other souls in purgatory that have a long time, and they just have one or two drops of water. And so... Um, those glasses, they need many prayers and many sacrifices to fill up. And also, they're kind of other than glasses. We could think of them as flowers. And we have these beautiful flowers that we put in a vase or we put in a pot and we put it on our deck and we put them in our house. But those flowers, they cannot bloom. They cannot be beautiful without our help. They can do nothing for themselves. They sit there in the vase and they're at our mercy. If we take their water away, if we take away their food, they're going to wither away and die. And they're never going to be the beautiful flowers that God created them to be. And so the souls in purgatory are like that. If we don't water them with the graces of our prayers and our, and our sacrifices, and we don't feed them through the graces that we receive through the sacraments here on earth, then they can no longer progress towards heaven. Their cup cannot be filled unless we fill it for them. And they're, they're, the flower that they're called to be to bloom in heaven will never bloom until the end of the world, but we can make it bloom quicker by our prayers and by our sacrifices. So that's what the church calls us to do all of November. And um, normally we say from November 1st to the 9th, kind of as a novena, an eight-day novena, uh, we go try your best, visit a cemetery, and we, we tell the faithful to pray five Our Fathers, five Hail Marys, and five Glory Bees. And obviously it's already the, uh, the 3rd of November. So if you haven't started yet, just try to do uh, eight days consecutive in November. If you can, try to go every day just to visit to the poor souls in the cemetery. Because there's many there, like we said, there's many glasses that have one drop in them and nobody remembers who they are. There could be the homeless guy that we always saw on the side of the street. He has no family left. Nobody knows his name. He could be in purgatory and nobody's praying for him. So this is the time to recall to our minds and to our hearts those souls. Because like I said, we have the, the three levels of the church and we just celebrated Christ the King. We are the church militant. We are soldiers of Christ. And to be a good soldier, a good soldier does not go into battle and worry about himself and get in, do, it, do what he needs to do and get out and not think of his fellow troops and not think of the sol soldiers that died on the battlefield that were his brothers. That's not a good soldier. A good soldier is one that goes in with... He is the, or a good general is one that goes to be the first on the battlefield and he's the last to leave. And they leave no soldier behind. And so that's what we are in, in the church today, in the world today. We're in a supernatural battle and we have to make sure we leave no soul behind. So be a good soldier. Remember those souls in purgatory each and every day, especially this month, and fill up their glasses and water the plants, their flowers, so that they might bloom in heaven. And then when they get to heaven, they'll be able to shine down grace on us and they'll remember each and every soul that prayed for them. So fill up their glasses through your prayers at the Mass today and each day wake up, think of the souls and ask God to give you an opportunity so that you might help them get closer to their eternal reward and then they will do the same for you. And God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.